Welcome to Connected. I am Fabiana Espinosa and I'm here to have a conversation with Cristina Zenato. She is going to tell us all about her journey as a professional diver and also about her relationship with sharks. Stick around. Cristina Zenato is a professional diver since 1994, an ocean and cave explorer, a shark expert, a speaker, writer and conservationist. Among her qualifications, Cristina is a PADI course director, NSS CDS advanced cave diving instructor and a TDI mixed guest instructor. She specializes in the shark handling courses and interactive dives. Christina is known for her special relationship with her local sharks and her passion for promoting the protection of all sharks in the world. She is an active cave instructor and avid explorer. To date, she holds the record for connecting a land cave with an open ocean blue hole and has completed two surveys of two full cave systems. Her field work with sharks and caves allows her to bring to the surface a unique perspective on life with a conservation approach to our relationship with this planet and other people. Christina has been inducted in the Women Divers Hall of Fame, the Explorers Club, the Ocean Artists Society, and she is a Platinum Pro 5000 recipient. Her biggest passion is teaching and sharing with the new and younger generations, offering support, training, and mentorship. Today, I have the pleasure to interview Cristina Zenato. Cristina, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us and welcome to Connected. Let's go ahead with the first question. Please tell us, how did your life lead you towards the path of diving? Any influences there? Uh, well, thank you. first of all, Fabiana, thank you for having me. It is a pleasure. Um, the first and foremost influence in my life was my dad. I grew up with an ocean family, both mom and dad, but especially dad. He had this uh, uh, beautiful book of pictures. He always been in the ocean as a military career, but then also for passion. And uh, he always took me there. I mean, by three years old, I would jump off the sailboat of my uncle and then I was swimming and then I had my first set of fins and mask and I never stopped. So I always had this dream of becoming a diver uh, thanks to the passion of my dad for the ocean. I was then inspired later by other people in other, in other, in other sectors, right? Dr. Eugene Clark specifically for the sharks or Ben Rose because of the work that I've done here. But my first and foremost inspiration was my dad. I see. So you started from a very, very early age. So tell me, let's say, of course, you had the influence and your, your parents or your father uh, taught you a lot. But tell me about your whole time learning about this. Did you go to uh, any school? Did you have any type of training? The whole time, that's 25 years. Do we have enough time? <laughs> So I always wanted to, my background is completely different from what I do now. I actually studied languages and hotel management, but then I ended up wanting to do a, a certification course and from a series of coincidences, many coincidences, I landed in the Bahamas. And once I did the course, I realized that I had two options, I either go back, continue with my work and then go scuba dive and learn twice a year change and that's what I did in a week time I quit everything and I stayed here and I started again uh, from ground zero because it was an open water diver so then I continue with my first instructor Norman Fanelli through my professional levels and then once I was an instructor I basically start working as a professional and then I 
got involved with the sharks and the caves and the technical diving and I, I haven't stopped learning yet. And through the years, I always say it takes a village to make a diver. Through the years, I had the influence of very uh, amazing people, so different ones, a uh, different stage of my life as well. I see. So when you when you talk about your profession, you said you mentioned technical diving. Is, are there different types of diving? Yes, and it's actually very hard for me to define specifically what I do. So um, there's many different kind of diving from commercial diving, which is the people that basically uh, go on the water to do specific jobs like welding or pipes or things like that. And they also use a different setup of setup and gear and support. Then we have the recreational divers, which is the scuba divers, the one that go with the tank on their shoulders and go and take pictures or videos. And I am one of those people, but I'm also like an instructor trainer. So I train instructor how to train people. And then there's a technical diving, which is a still like kind of like a recreational meaning that it's done by people for fun but the uh, requirements for the gear and the setup and support are also different and obviously I am a professional in, uh, in two of these fields so both the recreation and the technical so at the end of the day I also make a living out of that um, but it's, the, the diving is defined by basically many different things to be depth or the gas that the divers use or the kind of bottom times that they do so quite a lot of different definitions but yeah there's plenty of diving right and i only imagine the huge responsibility that it is not only training people that takes people underwater but also taking all of these people like you said some people are just you know like uh do it for fun but in order to take them on water it is it is a huge responsibility uh, absolutely, it is very much a, a big responsibility, and we're we're trained to do it safely and with fun. So it's always trying to balance, you know, uh, safety first, but then obviously with uh, a lot of fun. There's also a lot of training behind that. So. Let's say I am a person that I would like to go there for like fun. How long does it take? Like, how long is the training in order to get to get people down there? The first time? Yes. The first time doesn't take much. The first time takes about three days. And what it does, it gives you a license to be able to go down there. So then you can build your experience uh, in, in small steps. And so they give you quite a lot of uh, uh, kind of like limits. But those are limits there for your safety. So the first level, you can only go to 80 meters, 60 feet. And it's always recommended to go in the same kind of environment that you've been trained in. And it's recommended that if you change environment to go with an instructor. So we have quite a lot of rules to make this uh, very safe. But yeah, the first time make it three days and you can be a scuba diver. Wow, <laughs> I would love to do it. Tell us about your first experience exploring caves underwater. How old were you, like the first time that you actually went there and how long, like you, you, how was the longest that you were able to like explore down there? So um, again, cave diving is very progressive. So when I started, I didn't do the longest nor the uh, furthest or anything like that. The first time I went cave diving, I was, uh, it was in 1996, that's when I took my certification. So I learned how to be a cave diver and then I learned how to follow the lines laid by many cave divers before me. And then when I uh, started working on different kind of projects in different caves, uh, with time I realized that I could see uh, the caves in a different way, like anything that you get comfortable with and with experience. And so lately I've been doing most of my cave diving. So the longest I've been is about four and a half hours. Uh, the furthest I've been has been several kilometers in. Well, the, the beautiful part of this, I would say, is more the adrenaline. Because you go down there, but you never know what to expect. You know how to, what you have to do, how to be safe, but you never know how you're, what you're going to see. Tell us about those moments and that experience. 
No, it's not. It's not a wrong thing. It's through adrenaline. Um, I like not to call it adrenaline, uh, simply because, unfortunately, in our society, adrenaline is considered a, a consequence of risk taking. Now, naturally, human bodies do produce adrenaline. Uh, we even produce adrenaline when we're concentrating for an exam, for example. So I'm pretty sure when I'm cave diving, I am producing a certain level of adrenaline. The cave divers are highly trained people and we're very meticulous. If anything, we are the opposite of risk takers. We're actually very careful. Uh, we put a lot of time, like I prepared yesterday all my gear, all of my gases, all my computers and everything for today's dive. Then this morning when I went, I checked everything again. And then when I got to the cave, I rechecked everything. I did all the in-water check before I went. Um, but the sensation of finding something where nobody has ever been before, it's rather uh, unique and priceless. It's, uh, it, every time I think about it, I'm like the first man on the moon over and over and over again. And, and Definitely. It's almost like a, a treasure hunt because you definitely don't know what you're going to find and what you're not going to find. And a lot of people expect exploration that I'm, I'm going to go down there and find you know, the tunnels with the signs that say, go this way and go that way. And it, it's not. A lot of times it's failed attempts. If you find the cave, we call it pinched. You know, you can't go through or this collapsed or this is not available. But then there's a day where you go in and, and all of a sudden you swim up to the wall and you turn left and you turn right and all of a sudden it just or you go through something small and and then there's a cascade of decorations and everything. So it is like a treasure hunt. So amazing to hear all of this. So I am sure you have seen different types of fish, different type of octopus and a lot of different uh, life down there. But you have a special relationship with sharks. Tell us, how did that happen? <laughs> um, I have a special relationship with Caribbean reef sharks. And it happened thanks to my mentor, Ben Rose. Um, who had just started uh, the shark dive and I happened to land on the island as this was just in a developing process. And I always wanted to have sharks for friends. I was eight years old when I decided I will have sharks for friends. That was my dream childhood. Um, so when I saw him doing that, I was like, can I learn from you? And I learned from him, but then he retired shortly after and just left the entire, let's call it program to me. And so I started going down and doing the same thing with the Caribbean race sharks and growing a re relationship with them. He was just scuba diving with sharks. He was hand feeding the sharks and the sharks will just swim around him in this beautiful, peaceful circle. And he could also start in the beginning putting them to sleep. But, but the primary thing is he was just surrounded by sharks. And I, that's all I wanted. I wanted to be surrounded by sharks. So I learned how to feed sharks from him and I learned how to handle sharks from him. And that's how it started. And then slowly grew my relationship with the sharks and the, and the girls that are down there or the boys and start recognizing them and start noticing how long they were there. You know, I know some sharks now for the last 10, 12 years. Wow, you know, like you've seen the shark one time, that one shark, and then you recognize them every time you go down there and like at the same area or? So, it is the same area that I'm diving in. It's called dive site fidelity. That's how you get connection. So you establish a relationship. It's the same with anything, right? You can just um, meet someone for once and say, oh, that's my best friend. So right. I go to the same area and the sharks, um, they're very easily recognizable after a while. They all have different features, different colors or different features on their skin or different shapes. So, a uh, few of them have little, tiny little uh, effects on their fins, for example, or their dorsal fin, or the, the color of their eye. And um, oh, wow. you watch them, and then you start seeing them, and then you start recognizing them over and over again. 
and then they become a routine. I usually wait several months before I actually uh, start naming a shark, just making sure that he or she keeps coming back. I do this for a living, so we actually take people to see the sharks. So I'll go down there to feed the sharks, the people can see that, and then I do see the sharks. And so uh, that was the primary thing that I did. Then I start teaching a course where I can take people to do what I do, so they can wear the chain suit and go in the water with me and try it. Yes, and, and as I keep doing all this time down there, because I'm always with them, that's when I start collecting the names and the data. And then sometimes I go down and I have like a little camera and I've been taking pictures of all the fins and their eyes and their skin. So they're all cataloged by different uh, features. You know, there's a shark with a lighter skin, like very, very light skin. So her name is grandma, because when she's down there, it looks like light gray, like the hair of a grandma. A lot of sharks have names after their little blanch. Uh, for example, foggy eye has one eye that is completely gray. Instead of having the cat-like eye, it's completely gray. So her name is foggy eye. So that if you come and dive with me and I say, we're going to see foggy eye, she has a totally round gray eye. It's very easy for you to connect the name with the shark. And once I create the connection, because I have the connection with them, but if I can transfer that connection from me to you or to them or to everybody that is watching, then I lower the sharks from a monster level to, it's just an animal. It's just a fish. I don't know how many questions I received like, oh, how do you prevent the sharks from eating you? And I'm like, well, they're like fish. They swim like any other animal in the ocean. They're not, they're just waiting for someone to jump in. Exactly. exactly. Unfortunately, that's the reputation and that's the idea that I don't know why, uh, well, probably from the media and movies and stuff like that, we just have this idea that sharks are, ready, are waiting for us to, to eat us, <laughs> for us to get in the water and, and to eat us. I think the biggest problem is that when people say shark, they imagine one or two species. Usually they, you know, they imagine the great white or the bull shark and, and they fail to do the same thing that if I said birds, right? If I said birds and if I said all birds are black, even if you're not a bird connoisseur, you're, you're going to look at me and it's like, no, no, Christina, there's plenty of colorful birds. If I said all birds nest on the trees, or all birds fly, you will absolutely know that is not true. There are birds that don't fly, there's birds that nest on the ground, the birds that definitely don't look, don't sing very beautifully, and the birds that are not all black. But it's funny enough with the sharks, what I notice is when I say shark, everybody has one or two or three, maybe five images in their brain, and nobody goes, well, there's 500, and two the sharks is as big as this pen. It fits in the palm of the hand of a person. The smallest shark in the world, it's right here. Oh, so when people right. go, oh, you can avoid a shark attack, the question is, well, what shark? Where are you? What are you doing? Are you fishing? Are you spear fishing? Are you just swimming around? Are you swimming right. with these guys? Right, that is so important to know. And then tell us about your um, your suit. You have you wear a special suit. Um, is it heavier? Um, how how much does it protect you? Um, so the suit, it's designed to prevent to, to protect from what we call accidental bite and it's very protective. Um, it has a protection against the strength of the bite and also the uh, tip of the tooth. Uh, but the suit does not substitute knowledge, understanding and respect. So it's there the same way you wear a beekeeper suit, right? I, need, I know how to handle the bees and the honey. I wear the suit in case one or two bees decide to, to bite because maybe I upset them. So it's the same thing, the suit is there to help me do my job and prevent accident bites, but not necessarily it makes up for being careless or, you know, like disrespectful or not understanding what you're doing, what you're doing. And I say this because a lot of people think, oh, I'm gonna wear the suit, I'm gonna be okay. And it's like, no, you're not. With a shark swimming around me, I'm standing there with food in my hands and they're still swimming around me. Not, nobody is biting anyone. 
that is there in the moment I reach out and I try to feed someone and I make a mistake. But again, even that needs to be done with knowledge. So the suit is just, like I said, a beekeeper suit or a helmet for when you go on a moped. You don't go on a moped thinking you're going to fall every time you ride a moped. But the day you're fall is there just in case. You still need to know how to ride the moped. You still need to know how to ride the moped. Having the helmet is not going to help you much if you don't know how to ride the moped. Exactly. And I think that's a probably another, like, like you said, very important part when you're going to learn and to res learn to respect. So you have, you founded the nonprofit organization People of the Water. Tell me, how is the work, that, what's the work that you do with it and how has it been going for you? I just recently found a People of the Water, a nonprofit organization, to help me extend and my reach. So, and it's, uh, so what I am is I'm a professional diver, uh, but at the same time I've dedicated quite a lot of time, um, personal investment, money, personal money as well, right. to, for example, uh, map caves to protect the caves, so to train people on the side without, you know, charging and all this. So the people of the water is designed to support more of this work. It's designed to support more of my, for example, uh, presentation, classroom presentation, direct education courses that I can provide, as well as all the cave work uh, that I'm doing for like the Bahama National Trust to protect the caves. It's it's a uh, financial support of, of that kind and hopefully uh, with time it is brand new it's just a couple of months old uh, I'm ready to reach out for a couple of extra little pieces of tools which I've exited out and uh, with time hopefully I can also set up more of an educational program where I can um, select several people per year right now I can only do a few people per year bit expanded to basically welcome more in my mind more women but obviously guys as well but I, I feel you know like it's my duty as a woman to expand this a little bit to extend this a little bit more to to women that's awesome and then tell me like like right now you have your work it's underwater but now with your nonprofit and everything you want to do to expand of course you have to spend a lot of time also now like us on, on the regular Earth side of the planet. Tell me, how many hours weekly do you spend on the water? Like, normal for you? Well, things are not really much changing for me, meaning that I still had quite a lot of land-based jobs that I had to do in order for me also to go diving. Um, my average day is, it's, it's a 12 to 15 hour day. Uh, I do the, uh, for example, the emails, the email you send me, hey, Christina, I would like to talk to you. Well, maybe right. I was diving, so then I catch it either at the end of the day or the beginning of my day. And then I found time like this one, like today, I went cave diving in the morning and said, okay, I'm gonna talk to Fabiana this afternoon. So that doesn't change. Um, the time on the water depends on what I'm doing. If I'm teaching an instructor course, varies from uh, being teaching a cave course or being with the sharks and teaching a shark course. Uh, the thing is, my work is my passion. My passion is my work and, and everything blends in. So if somebody said, how many hours do you really work? It's very hard to time. define because right. I, I wake up at five and I have, you know, my cups and taking care of myself and my health. And then I start doing emails and then go for a run. And then I go to work where I go diving, but I already did work. <laughs> and then when I'm diving, sometimes like for the cave diving, I work all day. Like I was teaching an instructor course and that's a 12 days back to back, with no days off. And so in the evening I will go cave diving after five and then get home around 11 midnight and then start again the next day with the instructor course and then take one or two days off and then go at night again. So I would not go 12 days without cave diving. So that's what it takes. Christina, thank you so much for the work that you do. And women of the world, if you want to dive, go to the Bahamas and learn it with Christina. You are amazing. 
please share your social media information so people can follow you. Go ahead. Uh, my name is Christina Zanato and I'm a star thrower. I'm a firm believer that each and every one of us can make a difference in this world one small action at a time. And it comes from a little story that I heard a long time ago of this young kid that is in, on the beach throwing starfish back into the water. Into the, as the water is too shallow and the starfish are dying. And the old man tells him that by doing that he will never make a difference because there's miles and miles of beach and thousands and thousands of starfish. So he picks up another starfish and he puts it back in the water and he looks at the old man and says, but I made a difference for that one. So my message is, is just follow your heart and be a star thrower. Remember that a small action is better than no big action. And you can follow all my work on my social media, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. It's a Cristina Zanato, C-R-I-S-T-I-N-A-Z-E-N-A-T-O. And you follow non-profit work at People of the Water pownonprofit.org So very happy to have met Cristina Zenato. Her drive, determination and love for nature are definitely inspiring. Go support her and her project People of the Water. To connect with me, write an email to conectadosbolivia24 at gmail.com or you can PM me on my Facebook page. Stay connected and until next time, Bye-bye.